Kia ora and good morning everyone. Today we begin a new sermon series in support of Arotahi. Arotahi is the new name for the New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society. Arotahi means to focus in one direction, concentrating on one thing. Each year, we spend three weeks focusing on the work of our Baptist missionaries overseas and here in New Zealand. We call this three weeks focus on mission, Renew Together. In the past, it was called self-denial. Renew Together is about remembering God's mission of gospel renewal and our part in that mission. The New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society began in 1885 with this statement of purpose to fulfill the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ in those areas of the world to which he may direct. Over the three weeks of this year's Renew Together campaign, we will use the sermon time to focus on Jesus' great commission. Let us begin then with a reading from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. May the Spirit of Jesus illuminate God's word for us. Although this passage of scripture is called the Great Commission, there's actually more going on here, including some important things about Jesus' great authority and Jesus' great presence. We will get to the commission part of the Great Commission next week. The focus of this week's message is Jesus' authority. I grew up in the city of Hamilton. Unlike Wellington, the Waikato is a relatively flat place. The closest mountain of any significance is Mount Parongia, about half an hour's drive west of Hamilton. It takes four and a half hours to walk up Mount Parongia, give or take. The thing I remember about the climb was the way it just seemed to go on and on and on. You thought you were making progress and then you had to walk down into a saddle, knowing you would have to climb up that distance again. But just when you think the grind is never going to end, you come around a corner and there you are at the summit. It's a mountaintop moment. In general terms, a mountaintop moment is an expression which means a moment of exhilaration, joy and triumph after achieving a goal. In spiritual terms, though, a mountaintop moment refers to a significant revelation given by God. It's a sacred time when you feel especially close to the Lord. Mountaintop moments may not last long, but they have the feel of eternity, like you're transcending time somehow. They leave a lasting impression. Mountaintop moments are a gift from God. We can't really conjure them. But in the Bible, at least, they often come after some kind of ordeal. Abraham had a mountaintop moment when the angel of the Lord stopped him from sacrificing Isaac. Moses received the Ten Commandments on a mountain. And Elijah had a mountaintop moment after his confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Mountaintop moments mark the beginning, middle and end of Jesus' earthly ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus gives his famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Then in Matthew 17, we read of Jesus' transfiguration on a mountain, while in Matthew 28, the risen Jesus appears to his disciples on a mountain in Galilee. All of these are special moments of revelation given by God. The Sermon on the Mount reveals Jesus' authority in relation to the law. Jesus isn't just a skillful and wise teacher. He is the one who fulfills God's law of love on behalf of humanity. Likewise, the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain 
reveals Jesus' authority as God's representative. Jesus stands glorified alongside two of Israel's greatest prophets, Moses and Elijah. Then a voice from heaven says of Jesus, This is my son. Listen to him. Jesus is the one the prophets spoke about. The appearance of the risen Jesus on a mountaintop in Matthew 28 reveals Jesus' authority over life and death. Jesus has conquered sin and death through his obedience to God in going to the cross. Jesus has authority to grant eternal life. As much as we may enjoy the mountaintop moments and wish them to never end, we cannot remain on the mountain indefinitely. The disciples didn't stay on the mountaintop. They came down and went out into the world. In the same way, we must come down the mountain to live our lives on the flat. Where are you right now? Are you on the mountaintop or in the valley? Or somewhere in between? The mountaintop may be where we are most aware of God, but really God is with us wherever we are, even if we feel like we're in the pits. You've probably heard the saying, keep it real. It means something like, be honest, don't lie to yourself, be authentic, be who you are. The Bible has a way of keeping it real. It is such an honest book. It shows people as they are. It doesn't gloss over the mess or the complexity that comes with being human. Verse 17 of Matthew 28 keeps things real where it says, when the disciples saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. What we have here is a very honest picture of the disciples, a mixture of worship and doubt. These disciples are Jewish and had been raised in the knowledge of the Ten Commandments, which said you shall worship no other God but Yahweh. The fact that the disciples worshipped Jesus shows they acknowledged his divine authority. After three years of not really understanding who Jesus is, the disciples finally get it. A mountaintop moment of divine revelation. Matthew could have left out the part about some of the disciples doubting, but he chooses to leave it in. And I'm pleased he did. It has the ring of truth to it that resonates with our own experience. Matthew is keeping it real. So, what does it mean that some doubted? Well, it's not doubt in the sense of complete disbelief. It is not the intellectual doubt of an atheist. Nor is it the arrogant doubt of those opposed to Jesus, like the religious leaders who believed in God and yet disbelieved that Jesus is the Messiah of God. No, it is the kind of doubt that puts a person in two minds. It is an honest doubt that says, I want to believe the good news that Jesus is alive and God loves me, but I have some practical concerns that I find difficult to reconcile. We might call it the doubt that seeks integrity, not the doubt of a closed-minded skeptic, but the doubt of an open-minded seeker of the truth. Let me offer two examples of how this honest doubt operates. In the Gospel of John, the disciple Thomas refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead without physical proof. Thomas wanted to touch Jesus' wounds. For this, he earned the nickname Doubting Thomas, which is a bit unfair. When we consider Thomas's stand on this point, we notice a certain thoughtfulness and integrity in the man. He was not willing to simply go along with the crowd. Thomas was in two minds. He wanted to believe Jesus was alive, but he had some practical concerns he needed to reconcile, and he was being honest about that. When the risen Jesus did appear to Thomas a week later, Thomas believed and worshipped Jesus. Thomas rightly perceived Jesus' divine authority. The interesting thing is that of all the disciples, Thomas travelled further with the gospel than anyone else taking the message about Jesus all the way from Palestine to India. 
there is another way to understand the doubt of the disciples in this context. That is self-doubt. Richard France observes how the disciples were mindful of the way they had deserted Jesus when he needed them most. They were probably feeling a bit embarrassed by their lack of moral fiber. They may have had no doubt that God had raised Jesus from the dead. What they doubted was themselves. How can I call Jesus Lord and friend when I've let him down so badly? How can I worship Jesus with integrity after my own lack of integrity has been so clearly shown? You know, there are some worship songs I find hard to sing. I'm quite comfortable singing about the greatness of God and the worthiness of Jesus to receive all honor, praise and glory. I don't doubt that God raised Jesus from the dead. That makes perfect sense to me. But when the chorus has me singing about what I will do for God or what I will give to God, my confidence evaporates. I doubt myself with good reason. I know my own limitations. What integrity I do have stops me from making extravagant claims as to what I will do for God. Like the first disciples, I worship with some doubts about myself. The good news is that Jesus' authority is not threatened by the disciples' doubt. Jesus is not unsettled by your doubts either. Jesus understands our weakness and frailty and is able to work with us. Verse 18 tells us how Jesus came to the disciples and spoke to them. Many, many times in Matthew's gospel, we read how people came to Jesus, either for help or to question him. But only twice do we read that Jesus came to his disciples. Once in chapter 17, after his transfiguration, and then again in Matthew 28, after his resurrection. Jesus comes to restore a sense of normality when his disciples are feeling overwhelmed by a supernatural event. Isn't that cool? Jesus doesn't use his authority like a big stick to keep his disciples in fearful submission. Jesus uses his authority to reassure his disciples and to calm their fears. Jesus accepts his disciples' honest doubts and all. To be accepted by someone in authority is not only a great honor, it also fosters confidence and puts doubt in its place. Jesus' authority is greater than our doubts and fears. The message here is that honest doubt does not exclude you from friendship with Jesus, but cynical doubt will. Know yourself and keep it real with God. Perhaps the clearest indication of Jesus' authority in Matthew's gospel is found on the lips of Jesus himself, where the Lord says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is both a statement of fact and a reference to the prophet Daniel, who foresaw one like a son of man, who was given all authority by God Almighty, the Ancient of Days. Jesus is the Son of Man prophesied by Daniel. Giving all authority to Jesus is something God had planned for centuries. One thing we notice here is that Jesus' authority is universal. Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth. This means there is nowhere that Jesus is not in charge. There is no place seen or unseen that is beyond Jesus' jurisdiction. The risen Jesus is Lord of life and death, of time and eternity, of this world and the next. Another thing we notice is how Jesus' authority is given by God. It is not taken by force. In the same way that love can only be given freely, so too authority is given. Authority that is taken by force is not genuine, it is counterfeit. Jesus' authority is legitimate because it is given by God Almighty. Those who are familiar with Matthew's Gospel will understand that the key to Jesus' authority is found in Jesus' loving obedience to God the Father. In Matthew 4, we read that when Jesus was being tested in the wilderness, 
the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this will be yours, the devil said, if you bow down and worship me. But Jesus refused. Jesus would not betray God, nor take the devil's shortcut. By choosing the longer route of obedience to God, the Father, Jesus received all authority in heaven and earth, far more than Satan offered. Returning to Matthew 28, in verse 19, Jesus goes on to say, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We will get to the part about making disciples next week. Today, our focus is the authority of Jesus. Baptism is the initiation ceremony for Christians. Baptism represents a number of things, including submission to Jesus' authority. When we are baptized, we are effectively saying, Jesus is my Lord and King. I give my allegiance to Christ and commit myself to obeying him. We also see Jesus' authority in the baptismal formula he uses. Jesus the Son places himself in between God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying quite clearly here that he is divine. Notice, though, that we are baptized into the name, singular, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're not baptized into three names, but into one name. So God, the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. There is a mystery to the Trinity that we cannot fully comprehend. Let me leave you with this thought. Jesus, who has been given all authority in heaven and earth, shares his authority with his disciples by commissioning them to make more disciples. And who are Jesus' disciples? Is it just the 11 who met him on the mountain 2,000 years ago? No. A Christian disciple is anyone who loves and obeys Jesus. So the question is, do we love Jesus enough to do what he says? May our God of grace bless you with his peace and a deeper awareness of his love. Amen.